All right, so where does Islam come from? Where does that fit into the picture? Yeah, so Islam um, cropped up around 570 AD. So this is, you know, this is about 500 years after Christianity has already been in existence. And it was a religious and political movement that developed in the Middle East uh, in Mecca. Uh, the, the prophet Muhammad comes and he, con you know, he's considering his own spiritual lineage coming from uh, Ishmael rather than Isaac, right? So even the Jews claim Isaac's the son of promise. Christian Christians, you know, consider Abraham's son Isaac the son of promise, but they actually follow their lineage through Ishmael, which we don't know how historical that is, but that's, it's interesting if it was. Mm -hmm. um, Islam proclaims that Allah is the one true God, and he has come to restore, Muhammad has come to restore the primordial religion of both Adam and Abraham. So he sees himself as a reformer. Mm -hmm. And in the context in which he's operating, he really does reform because there's a lot of paganism there's a lot of tribal paganism going there's mostly polytheists in, in mecca mm -hmm. and so he goes and he smashes all the idols um and he he goes and among them they worship the uh, the chief god allah and so he says allah the chief god this is the one true god and from now on this is who we worship and so some of the major differences is that they're going to reject the trinity right mm -hmm. now you have to remember for christians to say god is love and to say God is Trinity is really to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because we, what we believe is that God in his innermost mystery, that one divine nature, one God, monotheism all together, but in that one divine mystery is this dynamic relationship of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that basically God's very nature is love. That's not Community. something that's ever explicit. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not something that's explicit in Judaism. Right. And it's definitely not something that's part of the Islamic understanding of God. God is power. Mm -hmm. and whatever God wills, you do it. And so in Islam, they're going to reject Jesus. Uh, they're going to say he's a prophet, but he's not God. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because one of the things popular in this area was this Christian heresy of Arianism. Yeah, yeah. Which believed uh, that Jesus was, a, was, was an important person in salvation, mm -hmm. but they denied his divinity. They thought he was on the created side of, of the ontological divide between creator and creation. That he's not really one with the Father. And so I think you almost see this adopting of this Aryan view of Jesus within to the very um, uh, religious understanding of who Jesus is. Um, some similarities is that, like us, they believe in one God. They believe Christ has a special role, even though it's not the same. They believe Abraham is the father of faith. And they also, interesting, have a tradition of honoring Mary as, as the mother of Christ. Uh, they have, a, you know, some, some have a very profound respect of Mary as well. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is super interesting. So um, why, I guess, why not believe in Islam then? Like as... Yeah, yeah. I guess this kind of goes into one of the last things we'll talk about. But um, really, it, the rejection of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing is, is why do we believe God has, has, has entered into a relationship with us through Christ? You know, that kind mm -hmm. of goes into, is Jesus the one? Mm -hmm. um and uh and so i think when you're looking at um monotheists i think there's other problems with islam too mm -hmm. um regarding uh philosophical reasoning mm -hmm. they because of the what they believe about god is power that anything allah wills that they don't necessarily believe in natural law or even if they do accept natural law right that there's certain things intrinsically evil like killing an innocent person um allah could ask you to do something that contradicts the natural law and then they would say oh yeah there's that's okay Whereas when you look at certain thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and this idea of the double truth in the middle that, that kind of developed, this idea, the double truth is saying that God can reveal something as true, and that we might know something to be true via our, our, our reason, and even if they contradict one another, they could both be true and you do what God says. Yeah, we and talked about Thomas that Aquinas, before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to say this is ridiculous because if God is the author of the book of nature, he, if he's the one responsible for creation, if he's the one responsible for the moral law um, as it exists and that we can reason to via our, our intellect. Mm -hmm. And then God also reveals himself through the church or through a religion. They can't contradict one another. God is mm -hmm. never going to ask us to do something that violates the natural law because the natural law is a, is a manifestation. It is, it is a mere expression of his divine nature. Mm -hmm. So, so God, these fundamental differences. Right. So God reveals himself to us through those 
like both of those ways that like God reveals yeah. himself to us through creation and through the natural law, but he also reveals himself to us sometimes through this revelation that he yeah. says something very specifically about himself to us. And if the two of those were contradictory, that wouldn't make sense because they're both coming from the same source. Yeah. Yeah, reject any notion of God Yeah, that, that there's a contradiction in the book of, of nature and the book of Revelation. Why? Because the book of nature and the book of Revelation has the same author, God. Mm-hmm. And so there, there shouldn't be any contradiction between the two. And so this becomes a part of that criteria, those, that threefold criteria, right? What do we know via reason? What do we know via human nature? And then what do we know in terms of the historical circumstances of what a religious tradition expresses or believes about who God is? Right. And so I think you, you have to have this understanding be, that faith and reason should never contradict each other because they have the same source, which is God. Cool. Okay. Um, so what else should we say? Um, maybe just you want to talk about the common, common themes, common, common patterns in world religions? Yeah, I think it's interesting because you do, if, if man is an inherently religious being, and I think this is interesting because I think you can understand all religions is a part of man's search for God, right? right? It's natural because of our very nature, because of the evidence of our human heart and because of our reasoning, it's very natural to believe in some type of higher power, right? Mm-hmm. To even through, through natural reason to think, well, there has to be some creator, um, but but how do I know more about him? And so it's so developing religion, of developing these tra- different understandings of really struggling that we see within the development of these different uh, traditions, um, there's, there's this understanding that there's some type of ultimate reality. There's some type of absolute that helps us understand the reality of the world, of who we are and how we should live. And, uh, and Hmong, there's usually this notion of creation that somehow um, this world is dependent upon some type of divine reality. Uh, there's some teaching about the human human beings being some, somehow divine, whether it's created in God's image or this part of the divinity and pantheism. Um, it kind of, humans kind of lose a certain dignity uh, when you get engaged in a pantheism, right. but it's still there. Kind of right? Everything down. has a certain yeah. dignity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just lose that sense of hierarchy of dignity. Um, there's usually some notion of redemption. All religions agree that human uh, race, you know, lives in a state in which they ought to be liberated, that we want to be better than what we are, right? Buddhism wants you to detach from desire. Hinduism wants you to go to a better caste system and eventually nirvana. You know, Islam wants you to be obedient to Allah and therefore, you know, be able to uh, become better in the life to come. Um, you know, there's always these notions that we see of, of becoming better over time. And that the difference is in a uh, in our, our human relationship and our inability to be better really is what leads us to misery, uh, you know, sin. Um, one of the big differences, though, is can we liberate ourselves or do we need some type of supernatural help, right? And this is one of the claims of Christianity is we can't liberate ourselves just through self-help, right? We need the, we need the help of the community. We need the help of God. Um, we ultimately need the help of, you know, the, the, the community that God gives us, the church, right? Um, and also in religion, in which there's no personal God, they tend to think, well, we have to liberate ourselves because God's not going to help us. God right? doesn't care because God's not personal. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess the final thing I would say about similarities is there's usually this notion of morality. Mm-hmm. Um, some or most religions accept some version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think that's built in human nature as well. Um, that's a part of natural law, to do unto others. We know it's good to be alive and know there are certain things that we need in order to live well. And if we know we need them, it's reasonable to think that other people need them as well. So we should, we should give people the types of things that we ourselves want. I think that's, that we know that from a love of just human reason. But we see this manifesting in many ways in these different moral traditions. Um, some, have a, um, some have a view of God that would create a logical contradiction um, in morality, as we say that if you think that God is going to ask you to do something that denies the dignity of the human person, that's problematic, or do something that violates the natural law. Um, so we see that in, you know, we see that in the Quran, we see that in the caste system of Hindus, that their, you know, the, their metaphysics, their, their understanding of, of, of the spiritual realm doesn't admit to a qualitative distinction between human persons or even subhuman, you know, um, and maybe even ultimately leads them to deny the intrinsic dignity of the human person, which we define problematic, given from a natural law perspective. 
Um, and then some will think that God will command you to do something that we would consider intrinsically evil and that it becomes good because God, no, 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 God's never going to contradict his nature. He's all good. And therefore he's not going to ask any of us to do something that, that contradicts the goodness of, of each other. And so I think those also becomes those kind of distinction of filtering between any religion that asks you to do something that's evil is not a religion worth believing in. Any God that would have you do something evil is not a God worth believing in. Right. And I th so I think that acts as one of the criteria as well. So it's just really important to uh, understand, again, that whole idea of natural law, like what we just, what we know, we intuit, like there's this, this reality of morality, you know, like that, that there's, yeah. you know, there's certain things that hurt us and hurt our relationships with others and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that like that is... God showing himself and then that revelation mm -hmm. of a religion saying this is this is how you act this is what you do this is how you worship this is who I am as a God you know that, that like all of that they have to go together they have to line up. integration right they should yeah. resonate yeah and so when we find a religion that's teaching the truth it should resonate with our heart's desires right and this yeah. is what we believe about the gospel the gospel is never an imposition of something foreign to us Rather, it's something that illuminates our heart and lets us see the reason why we were created in the first place. Right. And so we should, there should always be an integration between the divine law and the natural law. We should never see a, you know, a, a, a contradiction. We should experience sure. this sort of like, oh, like this, this is what I've been longing for. Like this is what I've been feeling this whole time, right? This is the thing that makes sense, right? Like it kind of, there's like something, exactly. yeah, to it. Cool. Okay, so um, specifically, why Christianity? Or do you have more to well, say? Yeah, yeah. No, I, and this goes into the why Christianity question. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things I think is interesting, just in terms of a thought process the, to think about, because as we see these different grapplings with the divine nature, is, are there many gods? Is, is, is ultimately, when we think about the ultimate source of reality, is it something that's diverse and many? Or is it just one? When we think about the ultimate source of all that we see, is it just one ultimate reality? Is, is the ultimate reality one or many? Is it monotheism or polytheism or some combination of being like a, you know, a pantheism, right? Um, and when you think about that, I think that makes sense. When we understand that all religions are man searching for God, it makes sense that you would see manifestation of both polytheism as well as monotheism and some combination between the two. Um, because when, you, when we're honest and we look at our experience of the world, we experience both unity and diversity. We experience, we even define it. What is, what is everything? Everything is the universe, right? Mm -hmm. But the universe is a collection of many parts. And each of these parts operate in order to create the harmony and the collective that we call the one universe. You, know, you can think of ecosystem. You have a system in which there's a unity of things um, working together you could think of the food chain and the biodiversity and everything has a role in order to sustain life, in order for things to exist in the unity that they exist. You could think of the unity of a community, which is a collection of many parts working together, a society, a collection of many individuals, you know, in unity of families and unity of, of uh, you know, parishes and state and, and so forth, that we work towards common goals. There's a unity, but yet within that unity is a diversity. You can think of the unity of the human body, right? I am one. But yeah. when I look at, you know, the many parts, the parts of my organs and my systems and my tissues and my cells, you have a lot of diversity and unities um, within the one unity that I am. And so I think this may creates a different interesting uh, reflection that it would make sense that if God does reveal himself to us, the one true God, because it can only be one for the reasons we said earlier, it'd be interesting that within that unity of the one divine nature, somehow there was also a, uh, a diversity a harmony of, of persons working together. Yeah. And so I think it's interesting because when you think about what God has revealed about his nature as being love, that in the one divine nature is a community of persons. Yeah. You have something that is both absolutely one. It's not a polytheism. It's not a pantheism because God is distinct from creation, but something that is absolutely one, one divine nature within that unity it subsists in a diversity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or as St. Augustine says, lover, beloved, and fountain of love. That God's innermost mystery is this dynamic relationship of self-gift. 
and that somehow the unity and diver uh, and, and this uh, that subsists in this diversity that is God, that it would make sense that creation somehow in some way mirrors this unity and diversity in a lesser way, right? That is not equal to God. And that therefore the unity and diversity of creation, the unity and diversity of us uh, and the types of relationships we're called to, it would be something that both that is both one, but in that unity is a harmony of relationships. There's something in us that knows the importance of us being one and being unique among many, right? Um, that like, we do have an individual consciousness and you know all of this kind of stuff like there's something mm -hmm. important about us being individuals but yet at the same time we also know that we're, we're created for community like we can't survive without it like we need it and when we don't have it we experience that suffering we experience that ache right and that like there's yeah. something in us that like both of those are important and we've actually talked about this in, in this class and um mm -hmm. talking a little bit about uh social teaching church of social teaching that there's this sort of unhappy often unhappy tension uh, in trying to organize a government, you know, or to organize a, a way of uh, doing society, right? That is both holding both of those things together. Yeah. Properly, Intention, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, so you have, you know, we talked about like on communism on one side of the spectrum, you have this sort of emphasis on the whole or the, the community, right? At the expense of the individual, right? That I may actually yep. be hurt, and that's fine because the only thing that matters is the community, right? It's the, the whole. But then on the other side of the spectrum, you might have more of like a, a capitalism or like a, a rampant kind of individualism that's based on like social Darwinism, right? That like, it's just about the individual, survival of the fittest. Like if you can step on everybody else in order to succeed, then fine, do it. The community doesn't matter. You're the only one that matters, right? Like you do what you want. Yeah. So, so sure. there's a problem with both of these, right? And the church is few because of the Trinity, right? Because of God. Um, yeah. So, and because of cor the corresponding human nature, which is created in the image of God, who right. is community, and that we're, we desire a community in which there's both a unity greater than ourselves, but which in the unity of ourselves receives its proper respect, its proper dignity, right? And so you have layers of unity. One of the things I always thought was interesting I wanted to do whenever I was pursuing one of my degrees is in philosophy is I wanted to write a thesis that uh, focused on the... Uh, the development of the one and the many throughout these different philosophical traditions. Because you have different philosophers that said, all oh, reality is one. And other philosophers that said, all oh, reality is many. There is no unity, right? There's only diversity. And, and you have certain philosophers that said, like Plato says, well, the good, the world of the forms is one, but this world is diverse and many, and it's an illusion, right? And then you have someone like Eric. And so you have these different competing views of how do we reconcile the one and the many. This is one of the prominent themes. And I think it's interesting that you see that theme in, within our religious traditions and our political traditions. And then ultimately God has revealed himself as something that is both absolutely one, but within that unity is this, is this like I said, a, a, a subsist in a diversity of persons in a communion of relationships. That's something that is able, able to, it's, to me it makes sense that if we grapple with this on the experiential level, it makes sense that the ultimate source, uh, God would ultimately reveal himself as the perfect harmony of both. So earlier you were talking about like uh, various religions being like our search for God. So mm -hmm. how's Christianity different? Yeah, I think it's interesting because <laughs> we can understand religion as man's search for God, man reaching up to God and trying to grasp and wanting to be in relationship with God, you know, but how frustrating would it be if that was just simply one sided and God never reached down. God never gave us a way to be in relationship with him, whether in this life or the next. And so where, where I would define uh, all religions as man reaching up, humanity reaching up to God, Christianity is not only about man's search for God, it's about God's search for man, that God reaches down, that he finds a way of drawing us into this relationship, that is communion, because he is communion, and that ultimately we're made for communion. And so we see Christianity as the coming together of these two desires, that, that really God enters into history because he desires a relationship with us. He wants to draw us into that relationship. Christ wants to draw us in that relationship he has with the Father. And so that we can participate through Christ in that eternal exchange of love. And I think one of the things we see is that there is no other religion that makes the same historical claims of God being with us as Christianity does. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but I guess the final point to say with that is that... Um, this is something the church believes is written on our hearts. 
that God never ceases to draw us to himself, to find a way of being in relationship with him. And so what, what religion teaches us that God wants to be in a fundamental relationship with us, that God's very nature is relationship, that God will stop at nothing and offering anything in order to give us the best opportunity of being in that relationship. Or as St. Augustine says, you, Lord, have encouraged man to delight in your praise. You have created us to be in relationship. There's a reason why in all these religions we reach up. It's because you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That we will not be able to live until we find the religion, until we find the invitation of being in that proper relationship with God. I think that's cool that that's, that's Augustine, right? Because, I mean, we talked about Augustine and stuff before that he's, he searched in many different uh, modes of belief and many different yeah. religions, right? And he's going through all these different uh, experiences throughout his life. And ultimately, he came to that conclusion that, like, nothing else satisfies. Like, only this this God who, who has made us for himself to be in that relationship that he is, right? The only thing that makes sense like based on the longings of our human heart and he was a person that had great longings you know, great passions and desires and you know, they searched a lot so. yeah and i think yeah, yeah i think you're right there's no accident that when you look at his own personal journey and struggle with god that it would make sense that he's the one that's articulating these things mm -hmm. you know someone else that a quote that comes to mind um one, and he was actually a great he wasn't catholic but you know he he he, uh, he could see himself kind of heading in that direction through the course of his life and more and more defending church teaching, but someone who uh, came over from atheism, which is C.S. Lewis. And, uh, you know, you could tell he's someone who struggled, like, why not, why believe in, a, in this type of God? Why believe in the God of Christ? Why does this make sense with the human heart? And something, a quote he said in his book, Miracles, he says this, he says, it's always shocking to meet life where we thought we were alone. Look out, we cry, it's alive. <laughs> and therefore, it's this at this point that many people draw back. Right? He says, he says, I would have done myself so myself if I could and proceed no further with Christianity, right? Like it's one thing to think that God exists. It's another thing to think that God wants to be in relationship with me. So he goes on to say, he says, Look, an impersonal God, well and good, a subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside of our own heads, better still. A formless life force surging through all of us, a vast power which we can tap, best of all, right? He's basically saying, wouldn't it be great if that's what God, <laughs> wouldn't that be convenient yeah. to how we want to live our lives? Yeah. But he goes on to say, but God himself, alive, pooling at the other end of the cord, perhaps approaching us at an infinite speed, the hunter, the king, the husband, that's quite another matter. He says, there comes a time when children who have been playing burglars hush suddenly. Was that a real footstep in the hall? There comes a moment when people who have been dabbling in religion, man's search for God, suddenly draw back. Supposing we have found him. We never meant for it to come to that. Worse still, supposing that he had found us. And so this is really what C.S. Lewis is describing, is that our search, our religion, can't just be our desire and our search for God. We have to also look for evidence that God has reached out and been searching for us. I think this becomes a compelling reason when we take all that consideration to believe, to go from this leap from the creator to Christianity. It's just, I love that quote. I just think it's great that there's, you know, we can do all this talking like you and I are doing right now, or like talking about God possibilities of God or yep. whatever but like when you get to that moment where you realize that someone's looking at you while you're doing it <laughs> they're like that not something is there but someone is looking at you you know what I mean it's like oh wow like that's that's yeah. something totally different and we, we get scared of that sometimes you know we want to draw back yeah, to that because we're like ah <laughs> like I'm seen yeah you know? yeah I'm found yeah I think I have a quote from Blaise Pascal he says knowledge of God is very far from love of him and I think one of the points Pascal is making is that thinking about God is not a substitute to being in relationship with God. It, what we talk about right here, all, none of this is a substitute to real faith. Real faith is about relationship. As, as G.K. Chesterton says, he says, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. And so ultimately, what religion is calling us into a love affair with God? You know, something that is em, 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 eminently personal. It's something that speaks to the desires of our human hearts. 
and that really desires to draw us into the very nature of God. That's, a, that's another thing that really gets me that, I don't know, difference in Christianity than other things is that idea of, like, Christi- Christianity is not just another moral system, right? Like, it's not just another morality, but it's, it's an actual person who we are called into a relationship to, and that's completely different. Right, like, because we could sit here all day and come up with all kinds of philosophies about how we should treat other people and how we should live our lives and whatever. But ultimately, that's not the point of our religion. The point of our religion is to enter into a relationship with all the moralities and all the philosophies and all the other things that kind of come with that is is pushing us towards relationship. Um, yeah. And so, I think that that is really the Christian difference. So. If you've made it about the rules, you you've, you've missed the point. Yeah, and Christians do this all the time. Christians miss the point yes. all the time, right? They don't even understand their own faith, right? So I think that's mm-hmm. why it's important to look to the saints, the people that actually are the um, sort of manifestation of, like, this is what it is to live Christianity. Like, those that's people right. have really understood it. Um, because when you look at their lives, then you're like, oh, that is different. <laughs> like, that is yeah. fundamentally different than, like, all these other people and all these other religions and stuff. You know? um, so, yeah. So uh, one of the last things I just kind of want to leave with for, for reflection is just something I came across by a father, Spitzer. He's a, he's a Jesuit priest, and um, he is, you yeah, you can share, yeah, if you, he's actually, if you, yeah, I can send you the link, and he has the actual, what, what he has, what I'm giving you is just an abbreviated version of what he goes through, and it's actually, um, he's dealing with that question, how do we go from believing there's a God to some type of creator or absolute reality to believing that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, right? Something that, that uh, you know, Grace expressed very, very perfectly at the very beginning of this, right? And so he wants to make this leap from a creator to Jesus as, as being God with us as, as intelligible as possible in terms of thinking of it, in terms of reason and human experience. And so what he, what he offers us in that, that article is really something that it came out of a conversation he had with this physics college student, right? He says, well, I'm on this retreat, I'm doing a nation retreat, and this, this, this student comes up to me, and he says, look, I resonate with belief in a creator because of the, the finitude intrinsic to time and the need for the origin of a universe to have a cause beyond a universal singularity, right? This is what this physics student is telling us, right? So he says, I have no problem believing in God, but I'm not so sure about Jesus. How can we say this Jesus stuff? How do we know Christianity? And so Father Spitzer is responding. He says, look, the Jesus thing is really about the unconditional love of God. It's about God wanting to be with us in a perfect act of empathy, about God wanting to save us unconditionally and bring us to his own life through unconditional love, right? That God is not, that ultimately it's not a disinterested, detached, or impersonal God. And so right now we're going to go through maybe just those six questions and this kind of logical pr- progression according to the logic of love, according to the fact that we as humans really desire love. Yeah. And so first question, what is the most positive and creative power or capacity within us, within me as a human, right? So think about that. What is the most um, positive and creative power you have? You know, well, first of all, you might say, well, maybe it's my intellect. Maybe it's my ability to think, my ability to know things, you know, or maybe it's my artistic ability, my artistic creativity, the ability to create beauty, to be able to do things that, that add value to the world, right? He says, actually, if we think about it, the ability to know something and the ability to create something is not necessarily positive in and, in and of itself. Why? Because we can use our knowledge and our beauty, and we can misuse these things, right? We could take the truth we know about somebody, we could take our ability to do something, and we could recreate something that's negative, that's destructive, that manipulates individuals and acts against the common good, right? And so then he goes on to say, there's actually one human power that contains in itself a, a very positive thing, that it, it can't be misused. He says, it's the one power that directs what is good. It directs our intellect, our truth, It directs our creativity, our free will towards its proper end. And what is that power? It's love. Love. To will the good of the other. The capacity for empathy by which we enter into a unity, right? We talked about unity and diversity, by which we enter into a unity with with others and a giving of ourself. That love 
This desire for love, it forms the fabric of society, of our human community. It's love is the nature by which we seek what is good. Love orders all other things towards the good. And it seeks to initiate and bring about what is good for each other. And so he says that really love is the supreme power, that it is even among the virtues, it is the thing that directs all other things, right? And so uh, this leads us into the second question. If love is the one power that seeks the positive in and of itself, and we are made to find our purpose in life through love, could God, could this all-powerful, perfect being who created us in this, with this loving nature, could he be lacking love, right? If we have this desire for love as a part of creation, could the one who, who is all-perfect be lacking the most positive power that we have as humans? Yeah, so like if think we, about that. if the perfection of what, of what we are and what we can do is love, then like how could a, someone who was, who did not possess that quality, like create something that does possess that yeah. highest quality, right? So that doesn't make yeah. sense, right? Mm -hmm. It goes against the principle or uh, the logical principle that no effect is greater than its cause. Right. And if creation, the effect of the creator has a power that is greater than what the creator possesses, then, then that's, a, that's a logical contradiction. Right. How is it that we as humans who were created by God are made for love if the creator is in fact lacking love. And so it would seem that we can only be fulfilled when we are loved and when we love others, how is it that God would create it this way? It would be absurd to think. But if God is love, then our nature would be consistent with who God is. Only that makes sense. And furthermore, if the creator is a perfect being, such a creator could not be lacking the one positive power and virtue which we possess as humans, which is the capacity to love. And so if you can agree with that, then he's like, well, then, then let's move on to the next question. All right? Is there any other thoughts about that before we move on? Not that I had it. It makes sense to me, at least. Um, yeah, that just that idea that the creator has to be greater than I am because the creator is creating me. And so if I have this power that is better than every other power that even I can see around me, like even greater than the animals, greater than the trees, you know, all of that, then like how could he not have that, but even greater have that, you know, be that, right? That thing. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. So yes, next question is about the nature of this love, right? Look at your desire to be loved. Do you desire to be loved conditionally or unconditionally? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do I only want to be loved sometimes or do I want a love that endures forever? When I, you know, have friends, do I only want them to be good friends sometimes or do I want to be good friends all the time? Yeah. And so he says, like, if we're honest, we desire perfect and unconditional love. Why? Because first of all, we have the power to love. We have the power to naturally be connected to other humans in this profound, empathetic, caring, self-giving, concerned, and accepting way of each other, right? This is the foundation of human relationships of community, of the types of friendships that we want to have in life, right? And we also, but even though we have that, we also know that we're not perfect, that we have a sense of wanting to grow in our ability to love. We want our love to be more perfect, to recognize that we have a need to pursue healthier, more loving relationships than we currently do. We want to improve in our ability to love one another. We want to put in the work to have healthy relationships of unity. And so he says, related to this, this desire to love is this expectation of more and more faithful love from each other, right? You might have a friend that they might hurt you and backstab you, but the longer you're in a relationship with them, then when you build up trust, you have an expectation that they're gonna stop doing that. They're gonna get better than that. We want more uh, over time from the people that we grow to trust. And the fact that we have this expectation, it generally leads us to disappointment, to the breakdown of relationships, right? What happens when your friend fails to meet your expectation? You know, what's going to happen to that relationship? Well, it's going to need healing. It's going to need mercy. It's going to need reconciliation. But the reason why we get disappointed in our relationships is because we have this deeper longing for unconditional love, right? It's like uh, a while back, uh, there was that AT&T commercial with the little kids. And he's like, is more better? And the kids are like, we want more. We want more, right? There's a desire when it comes for love. We want more. 
And so then he goes on to reflect our desire for perfect and unconditional love. It manifests itself in the very fact that we have very often been disappointed in our relationships, whether with family or friends or spouses or children or romantic interests, whatever it is. But this disappointment would, would not be there if there was not this underlying desire for a more perfect and an unconditional love. Right? That's just a part of the human experience. So then this leads us to the, uh, his fourth question, right? So we remember we're six questions. This is four. We're, we're, we're getting uh, over halfway through with this next question. If your desire for love can only be ultimately satisfied by unconditional love, then could the creator of this desire be anything less than unconditional love? Right? It, provided that we assume that a creator who is all good, who's all powerful, who is the very nature, you know, it, could he be anything less than unconditional love? Unless he intends to create us with an unfulfillable desire, which would be monstrous, he wouldn't be good. Yeah. And we can assume that God is perfect and God is in fact unconditional love. Or else why would he create us with a, with a, with a longing that he did, not, uh, he did not intend to somehow fulfill? Right? That would be inconsistent with our creator, um, who is unconditional love. And that, that love in principle is present within his creatures. It can only be fulfilled by perfect and unconditional love. Right? Does that make just, sense? Yeah, it does. Just to review, um, why is it again that we believe that God needs to be created? Like, Say that God, again. The God, the creator of God, why is it that we believe? We talked about him, like, he needs to be all powerful, like, 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 like you know, um, he may have mentioned, like, he needs to be all powerful, but like, all good, all good. Like, that's just because. We have that ability to at least love conditionally, right? Um, so then, is that why? Like, if the creator uh, needs to be all loving because if he isn't, then he shouldn't have that ability. Yeah. yeah. So we're, I think it follows from the other premises. If God is, in fact, one, which we've already demonstrated, if God is, in fact, good and he's not lacking any goodness because he's not lacking any perfection, if the highest good of humans is that we have to, you know, we can only be fulfilled by unconditional love. Then we would say, well, then God by nature would have to, would have to, if he, pres he possesses all perfections, he'd have to perfect, he'd have to possess the perfection of love. That the capacity, which is a present within us, the capacity to love, it would find, it'd be, it'd be present par excellence in God because he would be the source of our capacity to love. And therefore he'd be the fulfillment. Right, kind of going back to that quote from St. Augustine, Lord, you have created us for yourselves and our souls are restless until they rest in you. Um, there's a reason why we long for love, and that's because God has created us with a longing for himself, which is reasonable um, if we understand uh, human nature and the fact that we are created with this underlying desire for perfect and unconditional love. It necessarily follows from that. Okay. So going into the fifth question. If the creator is unconditional love, would he want to enter into a relationship with us of intense empathy? That is, wouldn't he want to be God with us, want to be Emmanuel, right? So that's what the word Emmanuel is, right? You're saying it during Chris, Christmas, right? Yeah. Oh, come, oh, come Emmanuel, right? We're saying, Lord, come, be God with us, enter into our, our situation, enter into the darkness, right? And so, you I mean, the, this shouldn't take much. This is kind of already implied. It's just unpacking it from a different angle. If God wasn't unconditional uh, love, it'd be ridiculous to say God would want to be with us, right? And we see this of why some believe in an impersonal God, because they don't believe God is love. They don't believe he's unconditional love. He doesn't really want to be in a relationship with us. And so therefore we have to save ourselves. He's not going to help us. He's not going to lift a finger. He's not going to seek us out. All we can do is seek him and he doesn't care about us. Why would God desire design us with a desire to seek him if he didn't also want to seek us, if he didn't want a relationship? It's a very, it, there's, there's an honest, inconsistency there. Why would God want to see anything? Like, if God yeah. just, just fulfilled himself for, right, or whatever, like, God was just God and he was perfect, then why create anything, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's not like the Greek God, you know, the woman who is God and God is the Um, that uh, needs to be some kind of, you know, it's like he's perfect, right? So if he's that, then why does he need to create anything at all? 
hard work. Mm -hmm. so that's it, that's exactly hard. right. Yeah. Okay. So well, God, and this is this is getting to something I also like to express is that there's a difference. If God was just power, if God was just will. And this is actually one of the uh, frustrations of the Romans against the early Christians of why some didn't believe in Jesus is because, you know, they, they say, why, it's ridiculous that God would want to become man. What is God lacking that he can gain by becoming man? And if you're trying to judge the incarnation according to the logic of power, it makes no sense because Jesus doesn't gain power by becoming man. And so they're making fun of Christians. It's like, what is your God lacking that he has to become man in order to become more powerful. That doesn't sound like a very powerful God, right? They understood that God was power. What they didn't understand is that God is love. Because when we look at the incarnation according to the logic of love, Jesus, the, the second person in the Trinity, doesn't become man. He doesn't incarnate into and assume a human nature and become Jesus Christ, right? Because Jesus is the earthly name of the created human nature, right? He doesn't do that because he's lacking something. He does it because we're lacking something and his very nature is love. He does it in order to be to bridge the gap, to be in relationship with us. And so this kind of goes into the, uh, to the, to the, the next question, right? If it would be typical that unconditional love, God would want to be fully with us, then is Jesus Christ the one? And this is the final question. If God is unconditional love, it makes sense that he would manifest that in the concrete circumstances of history. And so then we can look at what type of historical data corroborates the fact that God has bridged the gap between creator and creation, between eternity and the universe, both as Emmanuel, God with us, and as unconditional love. What religion teaches this? What religion um, has this as part of the historical claims? Right? Even when we think about Buddha, like Buddha didn't claim to be the way to God or the way to enlightenment or the way to Nirvana. He just says, I'm along the way. He doesn't, he doesn't think he's a messiah. And this is something that's singularly unique. Even Muhammad, right? I'm just a prophet, right? I'm just a dude. You know, like, don't look to me. Um, you see this among other religions. There's only one unique one where, where you have someone manifesting unconditional love and saying, I'm the gap. I and the Father are one. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, right? Whoever lives in me will live in, in God for all eternity. And so you see Jesus Christ as the historical manifestation of God, of Emmanuel, God with us, of bridging. So, so that, you know, we could be one uh, as, as him and the Father are one. That he can bring us into the unity of that divine relationship. And so, uh, you know, this is something that uh, Spitzer says. He says, it so happens that a remarkably powerful, experienceable event did at once manifest and synthesize these two corroborating data. Both God is Emmanuel and unconditional love. That is both experienceable and reasonable. And it's mutually corroborable through concrete experience and through the logic of love. And this remarkable experience event is Jesus Christ. Right? And so that kind of leads them to saying that, look, when we do, do a historical uh, study of what the claims, the historical claims of Christianity, right? Not just these kind of precepts or theories, that, but that God has entered into a relationship first with Israel, that he has nourished this relationship. He has revealed himself more and more, and they have come to know. And in the fullness of time, he reveals himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He reveals that his innermost mystery is love. And then he reveals through Jesus Christ and the church a way to be in a relationship with them. And so that's really what the church is. The church is God's invitation to be in relationship with him. And this is really what the gospel is about, that the apostles went out and they proclaimed the kingdom of God and that we have a way to be in relationship with unconditional love. And that way is Jesus Christ. And it's in light of this that Christianity becomes eminently reasonable. That it's not just... Uh, an act of faith doesn't just result from a single factor, but really it's a convergence of evidence, of, of reason, of the natural law, of the evidence of the human heart and human experience and our longing for unconditional love and the historical reality that God has manifested himself in history and his relationship to Israel and in the event of Jesus Christ. 
and that this shows that Christianity is not only reasonable, but maybe the most reasonable um, among all the various world religions, that there's a coherence to the claims of Christianity, and that it's, that it's a convergence um, of, of these many factors. And I would even say, even as we talk about this in terms of this intellectual uh, understanding, to go back to what I said about before, that thinking about God is no substitute for a relationship. That, but it's good to think about these things because these things can provide a preparation for faith. And like any human relationship, faith and a God, it's, it's, it's within a God who is personal, who is unconditional love. And it revolves a revelation and trust that is appropriate to a relationship. And so we spend the rest of this life and the rest of eternity being drawn into the very mystery and life of our God, right? Of unconditional love. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Father Ryan. A lot, but really good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's anything else. Just I encourage you to to seek, be seekers of our Lord. There is nothing that can absolve you of your responsibility to seek sincerely the desires of your human heart to be loved, to find where the Lord is calling you and where He is bringing you into relationship with Himself, so that He can fulfill those desires, so that you uh, can know what your life is about, who you're meant to be, and how you are to live. All right. Well, thanks. See you guys okay. next time. <laughs>